Okay, welcome back to the conference, the Plown Conference 2021. And it is our fourth day of talks. And with me now is Will Gwynn, who is the manager of web communications mm -hmm. at the Purdue College of Engineering, a slightly well-known university institution in the US. And Annette Lewis, who is my colleague at Six Feet Up. She's a rock star developer. And today they're going to be talking to us about a Zope to Plone migration for the Purdue College of Engineering. Take it away, Will and Annette. Hello, and welcome to our talk today from Zope to Plone, thinking user first during migration. We already had introductions, but I'm still going to do it again. So once again, my name is Annette. I'm a senior Python developer at Six Feet Up. I got it started with Plone in 2013, and I've been running the running since wildly with it ever since. So lots of fun. And then today I have a co-presenter with me. Yep. Hello, my name is Will Gwynn. So I'm the manager of web communications for Purdue University's College of Engineering. Uh, my background is in UX UI design. Uh, so I'm def definitely used to looking at the front end, um, but in the last few years, I've gotten more into project management. Uh, so I manage the college's team in uh, a lot of our digital marketing and communications initiatives for the college. So I'm really pleased to be here with uh, Annette today presenting on this topic. So getting right first. into it, go ahead. No, go ahead. Okay, so jumping right in here, we have the, uh, we had this, the, co the Purdue College of Engineering has this massive migration project uh, that really needed to be done um, really for, for the last several years. Um, so one thing, you know, you'll, one thing you find out about working in higher ed is that uh, higher ed tends to move a little slower. People get really used to the things that they work in. Uh, they resist change uh, actively. So um, it's always a pretty big undertaking. Anytime you have a big project like this one where you're migrating out of one content management system into a new one. So we have, uh, we have this. We have this current CMS. Um, go ahead and go to the next slide, Annette. We're in a current CMS called Zope, and it's it's Zope's built in built in Python. Uh, it's 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 got a lot of really really positive good features that we that we use at the college. It's really our entire college infrastructure is built in Python uh, using Zope as sort of the framework. So. Um, one of the big things we needed to be able to do was was maintain that that Python framework. We really had so much of our web apps, a lot of our a lot of our you know tools and things that our college uses on a day to day basis were all Python based web apps. So uh, that was one of the biggest things we had to focus on in moving to a new CMS. So we introduced Python to the college back in two thousand and one. And because of, because of the version of Python we were using, we were seeing a lot of security concerns come up. Uh, and that was one of the big drivers for, for change. Uh, one of the big motivations we had to get out of um, Zope and into Plone. Uh, and obviously the, there were a great deal of modern, modernization issues. So there were a lot of things in Zope that, you know, our current content editors, a lot of the folks that uh, work in the college on websites and manage websites, um, they were having to utilize you know, code, copy and paste code. These are people who are not web developers. They're not web designers. They have no background. Um, we weren't about to try to teach them all of these different languages. Uh, so we really needed to, to provide a way, a really easy way for them to be able to manage and maintain their websites. So that was another really big driver for change for us. <clears throat> go ahead and go to the next slide there, Annette. <clears throat> so kind of looking at the numbers behind this entire project. When you look at the Purdue College of Engineering, it really is kind of a kind of a mini university in and of itself. It's it's massive. Um, when you look at all of our sites, um, we only really had fifteen content editors, which which isn't a lot when you look at how many subsites we have. Uh, more than forty public facing subsites. So there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of content sharing, a lot of double dipping here. There's a lot of there's there's you know individuals managing multiple sites. Um, those sites consist of over 30,000 pages. So, you know, it really is, it's, it's quite a, quite an undertaking when you're, when you're talking about migrating from, from one CMS to another one. Um, those 30,000 pages really consist of 20, uh, about 25 departments and units um, in the college. There's a, there's a slew of, of other research labs and, uh, and faculty websites out there as well. So it's it's a it's a massive undertaking, and it's and it's one that we that we really had to be very deliberate about from from the very beginning. Um, 
So go ahead and head to the next slide there, Annette. So we really, we sat down at the table. We, we just started, we started to discuss, okay, what's the best solution? If we had to start all over again, what would we go with? Um, and that's, you know, that's where a lot of, a lot of time and effort and a lot of discussions were had. Uh, so we worked with our IT department. It's called ECN, Engineering Computing Computer Network. Uh, they are sort of the, the, the masterminds behind sort of the infrastructure and what, uh, you know, the different servers and the security and everything that goes into what we've been using in Zope for all these years. Uh, so we, we all agreed at the table, we really need to, to look at modernizing our current CMS. So um, we agreed that, you know, staying in Python was really the best choice because um, so many of our web apps, like I mentioned earlier, are built in Python. Uh, we, we rely on it almost exclusively for, for so many of the, the inner workings of our college. A lot of faculty depend on it to serve up web apps for research. Uh, so we really need to stay in that, in that environment. Um, so we looked at we looked at Drupal, we looked at WordPress, we looked at some of the PHP based solutions out there, and we just decided that that's just going to be that's going to become too much, too much of an undertaking to uh, to try to change our environment like this. So uh, that's when that's when Plone entered the discussion, and that's where uh, we really enlisted the assistance of Six Feet Up to help us kind of work through some of those infrastructure issues. How do we actually get this thing up and running? Um, what are some of the concerns? What are some of the challenges going to be? Uh, this all started way back in 2018. So, um, you know, there was a lot of just preparation, a lot of discussion uh, right from the get go. So now that we have a basic understanding of kind of where the project came from, the first question you always ask is how do we move from requirements to actionable items? Especially in this case, with such a large entity, we wanted to minimize the effect on users we want to improve the user's experiences where we could. And then that means I really have to ask me a question. Who are my users? Not just that, but who are the users of the client ultimately down the road? Because I'm trying to make products for Will and his team, but eventually it's going to be the content editors down the line that really need to work with this. So. Looking at that, we start by identifying the current challenges. And we kind of broke that up into some big, broad groups, just like the user editing experience is something that we could hear clearly was a problem for them. Um, and that with the users having to blindly paste code into templates to try and build their pages and using a code editor for formatting text, we knew Clone was a great fit for that, which it's rich um, text editors. Also user management and user permissions because right now they're managing users almost locally to areas. So if you had to find a user, you had to go find that user in that area. So a decentralized user list is difficult, but Plone has a great user permissions management story. And then just the infrastructure alone, um, that you're working with an aging system and you have excellent in-house expertise for what you have right now. And it's really important to us that you can maintain the stack and that you're familiar and you can take ownership with it if you need to. So that introduced a lot of challenges during this whole process. So you know, one of the things we really had to keep in mind really midway through this migration effort in working with Six Feet Up, uh, we had a, the, the Purdue University Central Marketing Office initiated a, uh, a rebrand, really a, a complete overhaul of our entire brand standards. So. Uh, we had one look, one front end look that we were going with from really the beginning of 2016 that had to be changed just from, you know, from stem to stern. Uh, so we, we began the process, you know, halfway through this migration, trying to adapt uh, the templates, the front end look of everything we were doing in Plone to match those brand standards. So there had to be a way to seamlessly blend all of the subsites that we're using the old look, the old template into the new look, uh, which was what our parent site was utilizing. So uh, all new colors, all new typefaces, really everything from, from top to bottom had to be overhauled. So um, that was one of the big challenges. It's just, you know, how do you deal with a rebrand from the university midway through a migration uh, when you've already established all of your, the looks of all your templates? Uh, another challenge we faced was uh, converting all of our content types from Zope over to um, some uh, reciprocal or congruent content types in Plone. 
there were just, I mean, there were countless content types we were using in Zope over the years. I mean, like I said, we've been in Zope since 2001. And so how do we, how do we try to marry those up with, with what Plone's doing? And so there was a lot of discussion and planning around, okay, you know, is this going to be a one-to-one -one transition? Uh, is it going to be seamless? You know, is there going to be anything that, that gets, um, that we have to kind of move on from? Uh, is there legacy stuff that we can bring over with it? So, you know, a lot of, a lot of challenges around that. And then obviously just the, the user experience. So, you know, one of the big drivers I mentioned earlier behind this migration effort was trying to give our, our content editors a modernized inter interface to work within, something that um, doesn't require them to have to use, to know code or to use code. So, you know, a lot of the, every step along the way, we were trying to think about the end user, you know, what is it they're gonna do? What, how are they gonna utilize this tool? Um, is it visual enough for them to be able to, to you know, know how to use it even without any instruction from us? Uh, so that's, that's always a challenge is how do you, you know, when you, when you think through how someone without training is going to utilize your platform, um, is it going to work? So from here, whenever I'm dealing with such a big project, especially since we've got many living pieces, it's an active production website. There's many stakeholders. Um, the first thing I like to do is distill it down into a few broad categories so I can look at my requirements and say, okay, this is the essence of the project. So with this scale of a project, I would think that comes down to accessibility, usability, flexibility, and security. And what these broad categories really are is just the purpose and essence of the projects. So that once I get down into the technical requirements, I don't lose sight of that. Um, when building the system. And I'm really continuing with that user first development style. And of course, best practices are always a given, but I kind of use these as my focal point when I'm starting to develop any solutions. Now, of course, the next thing about that is giving chances. Uh, developers love to craft beautiful systems. We want cutting edge, modern technologies, solid architecture. We want the best of the best. Um, <clears throat> Looking at this especially, the absolute best might not always be the right answer. And that's where collaboration becomes key. Um, we always like to communicate. So like whenever we saw something, we said, well, here's an idea of some way we could do something. Let's explain it. Let's talk about this. And sometimes we get an idea and we're just like, mm, maybe that's not the best. It's okay to say no, but we always would have an alternative solution ready and just kind of work to get through what's going to be the best solution for everybody involved. Never ignore best practices though. But that open communication, uh, especially with Purdue and engineering, really helped us, I think, come up with even some better solutions than we'd always think. And um, I like to ask myself every time, like, is it a best practice? Is it a bad practice? Is it a dangerous practice? Always going to avoid the last ones, always aiming for the best. And sometimes we land a little bit in the middle there, but if the users are having a great experience and it makes them feel like they can take ownership, then I think we're doing a great job. Yeah, really, I really want to underscore this because, um, you know, like I mentioned, you're going to see kind of a recurring theme throughout this presentation about, you know, collaboration, discussion, kind of sharing ideas, transferring ideas. And that was, that was such a, a crucial aspect of this entire process was, you know, really coming out of our silos as a college, especially our IT group and our communications group. And, and having someone at the table with us to be able to kind of demystify a lot of the things that we didn't know. In a lot of cases, we didn't know what we didn't know. So having six feet up there, having a net around, having Chrissy, having everyone there to be able to say, okay, here's your best bet. This is what people are doing to, in today's industry. Here's the standard. Um, this is what you need to look at. And so that's, that's such a crucial aspect of this. I can't, I can't emphasize that enough. Then on to our actual development goals. Since we're going Zoop to Plone, it could be really easy to think these are pretty similar. You know, Zoop is on the back end of Plone. We can just go from here to there and it'll be okay. But we really wanted to make sure that we were doing things in a Plone-like way for whatever we were transferring. And, you know, technology is always evolving. So the next thing is if there's something that's being done right now and so how can we bring that to the best practices of now? And always, always, People aren't going to read. If you have a huge document, they're gonna try and skim and get to the base of what they need to do quickly. And that could be even more overwhelming for someone who's not technical or code-based. So 
we tried to make it intuitive especially because people have their biases. Um, I like to say, if you pick up your toothbrush with your right hand every day, if it's on the left, you're gonna reach for your right first. So when we were making the new systems, especially since there were existing systems that your users were familiar with, we were going to try and make it intuitive so that it makes sense. And then make sure that if anything did have to be changed to be vastly different, we tried to make sure it was definitely going to be an improvement. Like let's not, overturn everything and say, well, here's something you're stuck with. Let's try and make it better so that they think this is a great experience. I like this. I like this new way of doing things. And to get to that stage, as a developer, I often have to think in many roles, not just me as a developer, or even as Will as like the facilitator on their end, but really the system administrators, the content editors, the site administrators, and the technical support staff who have to support that stack. We want to give them something that they can all use. now into actually crafting some of the solutions and some of the things we put in place. And we did so many interesting things with this site. So it was tough. Like Will and I went back and forth and tried to figure out what are some cool things that we did. And even just in that conversation, some of the things I'm like, this is the coolest thing ever, which were just technical. It was amazing. Some of the simpler things that I take for granted that really benefited Will and his team. Yeah, you know, in a lot of ways, um... This, this process of looking at the solutions before we, before we moved forward with them, it felt like almost like going car shopping. <laughs> In a way, it was like, you know, you get that excitement of going to a dealership and you see all the fancy new cars, you see all the features associated with them. You got, you kind of, you kind of, your eyes kind of glaze over because you're like, what do I, what do I go with? There's so many opportunities here. There's so many ways I could, I could solve this problem. Um, and, and so like looking at these solutions, like, you know, Mosaic, Diazo, like there's all these things you can do that, that will solve your problem in, in infinite different ways. So yeah, you kind of get that excitement built up. That's when things start to get really interesting is I mean, going through some of these solutions with Six Feet Up. So we picked just a couple. Um, we talked, I thought the content migration was really neat. Um, we, of course, Diazo was key to helping to port an existing theme into Plone, especially because it was still changing. Mosaic, which I think was one of the real superstars for the editors and being able to have that through the web WYSIWYG experience and then the sandbox. So we're gonna dive a little bit deeper into each one of these, starting with uh, content migration. And the challenge about this is we weren't moving everything at one shot. We needed to be able to pull pieces of this but they were changing. I couldn't just pull one export and then say, just pick up a piece. So we need to be able to move the subsites one by one as needed. So we ended up modifying some of the migration codes so that we could target specific areas and folders of the site and just export that. Then we also had the pipelines to translate the content and the images and everything that had, they had existing into new clone content types. And then I think one of the really cool things that we did is, you know, we had it so that you could re-import content over existing content non-destructively. So if we had to redo all the images or something, we could just delete all the current images in the staging site and just re-import that content, which really did come in handy. And of course, we had to rebuild a couple structures by hand, but that's a given because that was the improvement in the modernization of what we were doing with this. And then theming which was quite a challenge. And that was about retrofitting flowing into an existing theme. Thankfully, that's exactly what Diazo is meant for doing. So we were able to use Diazo and uh, XSALT or XSLT um, to do a lot of transformations on content to make it really look like their current brand. But we also had to think because they did change their brand halfway through with new assets, new colors, new everything. And Thankfully, we didn't theme ourselves into a corner. Um, what we do is we have one file that's like the brand prod truth file. And then we've got some other files for like migration fixes, just to mitigate things that need to look more like clone and then anything else that we had to add. So that keeps these separate. And that's so if engineering ever just had a whole new file, we could at least just drop that in and then still just do small adjustments for the clone part. And that really helped us to implement the new features in Plone in a Plone-like way without getting stuck in a corner and saying, oh, we need to go change this file and then having to figure out what differences that we make down the line. 
Yeah, that's and that's going to get more into that here in a little bit. But that's that's very true. We we really truly have a living theme. Um, the the central Purdue University marketing office is constantly introducing uh, little changes to to the web templates that they're requiring all the other colleges to incorporate. So um, yeah, we're very much making little tweaks and changes along the way. Um, so this this ISO solution really really kind of makes that no sweat for us. It's not a problem to, uh, to sort of change everything globally at, at once. Um, there's really no headache involved. We also had to answer a, a great question, which is how do you let 40 plus subsites own their content while staying within visual brand, brand guidelines, but make little tweaks here and there? And Purdue had an interesting solution in place, which was their local.css. So each little subsite could have its own local.css file so they could change some minor things like little fixings and spaces. That is not a plumb thing at all to begin with. And that was one of the, uh, do you really need this? Can we change this? Can we morph this? But in talking with Purdue, we found out this was really important for engineering to have that. So we ended up coming up with a really interesting solution. Like Chrissy gets this wherever you are. Thanks, Chrissy. Um, but we recreated that feature through the web in the ZMI. So we added a custom browser view called local.css, which is great because since it's got a .css ending and it's got the right line type, browsers interpret it as CSS and will catch it. And then we have an action in the menu for each page where you can edit this local CSS and it can even inherit um, CSS from the parents. So what that ends up looking like is this page right here. So we have this local CSS. You can view the inherited CSS. You can type in your new code. And then that makes it really easy for the users locally to make a couple of mild changes if they need to without having to go through an entire release process or trying to specifically get just one section of the site since this is all in one big site. Yeah, this a lot of the big driver behind this, this local CSS solution, this is you know, this is kind of what you get into working in higher ed. Um, you, you have a lot of different department heads. They have a lot of people, a lot of different people in charge of subsites. And so, you know, you try to keep them all within brand. You have a, you have to meet that basic requirement, but then beyond that, there's a lot of little tweaks that not all department heads agree should be the way their site looks. So you need to have that, that sort of granular control over little aspects of a site like maybe sometimes you know this department head wants a different shade of gold for that heading so you have that ability using the local css to be able to make that tweak on a site-to-site -site basis uh so that's that's been a big help and another thing that we ended up adding <clears throat> is we have all these sub sites and they needed to be able to do some type of control of some of the things particularly the navigation. As we started going through, there were different types of navigation menus. So we needed a way for them to switch. And then site header text and just minor things. So our solution was a sub-site settings control panel. And since these are all lineage sites, we were able to use lineage.registry, which gives you a local clone app registry for each site. And then we could have customized the sub-sites through that with a little panel that we made. So here's an example of the panel, and you can see we have the manage subsite properties that's right at the base of the site, and it's only at the very base of the site, so you don't get to it by accident. And then once you go into this, you could set things like the navigation menu. So the first example I have up top is the engineering typical menu, what they would have across sites with that option, but they could also use a dynamically generated menu. So this is just like clones typical menu. And on top of that, because sometimes you need that extra layer of customization, we have the manually manage the structure. So someone who's really knows exactly what they want could actually put in their HTML directly for their menu, and that would populate up in the menu bar. And we're using Diazo to make those switches along with that registry value. Another thing we can actually do is set the parent text for the banner. So if you needed to set extra text here, and then you can actually link that to a custom destination if you needed to. So that's all through the web at a site level that the site users can manage this and get some more customization in their site. Yeah, this is huge because you know before in Zope, our content editors had to use 
they had to rely upon code and, and insert properties into the site using code. Um, this took all of the effort out of my team to be able to train content editors who had no prior experience in, in using code to be able to select a, a menu, a drop down, pick what they need, and move on, move along. So you know, you're still there is still that solution for someone who who knows code. They can they can manually you know adjust their navigation menus if they want. Great, we have that option. But this takes away all of the the effort that we used to have to to try to manage um, when setting up a new site. And then the other thing we put in is mosaic, which is was an easy choice once we looked at the structure of how the engineering pages were put together, um, especially with each little subsite needing its own homepage. Um, this was an easy choice here. And I'll let Will start talking. Yeah, so so mosaic is is something I get really fired up about because um, you know, going back to the the car dealership metaphor here, it's it's like that this was like the Ferrari on the in the in the in the showroom, right? This was the thing that got us really excited about this this move to plone. Um, Mosaic solves so many problems. I could probably do an entire forty five minute presentation just on Mosaic and and how how good of a fit it is for the College of Engineering. But just to put it all into a nutshell, so um, the way our content editors were asked to to build their landing pages was through sort of a library of code snippets we call them blocks and so we would ask them in training to you know, to build their landing pages go to this this site that shows all the blocks copy and paste what they want and then you know that would be sort of the way they build their their landing page it's all done using a code editor no, nothing visual at all about it so what mosaic allowed us to do now is to actually take away all of these code blocks and just instead put it into a, a really easy intuitive simple editing interface, drag and drop, selecting from contextual menus, having a way to do this without any code at all. And so that's that's what Mosaic was able to do for us. We can, through the web, drag and drop, build out a layout, rapidly prototype something that would have taken several hours in the old system, you know, copying and pasting snippets of code. Uh, now it's it's not only not only is it easy, but it's actually kind of fun. So now we have content editors who are just having a blast building out different landing pages, um, sub landing pages. Uh, it really is a joy to use. And it's something that, that we really kind of hang our hat on now uh, as, we, as we've moved into the Plone, into, into Plone's CMS. That's one of the things that gets, it gets our content editors most excited. Um, they, they can't wait to get in there and use it when we demonstrate it for them. So when we look at the next slide here, this is really kind of a, um, this is an example of, of one of the the code blocks that we would ask them to to copy from our block website, our block library into into the code editor. And so this is like a basic, you know, homepage banner. Uh, this really isn't even the most intimidating intimidating looking block. We had we had some that were pretty gnarly looking uh, that would go, you know, dozens of lines uh, that we'd expect them to be able to. And they have no idea what they're looking at. They're 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 copying blocks of code and they're not sure if they're supposed to take the whole thing or just a snippet of it or portion of it so uh, this would cause a lot of problems for us and, and raise a lot of questions and so when you look at the next slide you kind of get an idea of what it is they're building what's the actual what's the actual front end um, at the end of the day this is you know this is all just python code and how it translates into a landing page and so you know that's that's the idea of what you ideally get from from working in zope and then we go to the next slide the reality is this is what they're working within and it's a code editor. And so there's, that's kind of a, a really good uh, representation of, of what it looks like to our, our content editors. And again, these are, these are not web developers. These are people who are just trying to do their jobs and, and, you know, web design development is not a part of the, that, that job description. So uh, we get a lot of problems, a lot of requests for help. Um, there's a lot of things that break because they just, this is not their day to day. So Mosaic really, you know, it, it, it solves this humongous problem of ours, just taking away all of that code, putting it in a really elegant, easy to use intuitive interface and, and making it actually kind of fun. So um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna let Annette get into the demo. Yeah, I'll admit, even looking at this page, I've looked at their code before and 
it, it takes some reading to figure out what does what, even with the guide. So I couldn't only imagine what it felt like for a non-technical user to say, well, I'm just putting this here and hopefully this shows up on the page and everything's okay. But that's exactly why we put in something like Mosaic. And I have a little demo of a page that I built here. There we go. So here is a Mosaic page that I made up within the Purdue template and just kind of that the features that I've got, and this is all mosaic tiles that we were able to create for them. And so I'll go ahead and edit this. And so this is a banner tile. So now when they need to put in the banner, all they have to do is insert banner image and they just pick where their image comes from. So I have like an images folder. They can add a title and they can add a description and it comes in different styles. If they want the links underneath, we have this handy link. So this is like the one place they'll have to know some code, but you can insert banner links. And it actually comes with a starter template. So you can just copy and paste. Like this is a small chunk of code that you'd have to edit as opposed to a whole page. And then that's the banner links at the bottom. Once again, the rich text tile was really big because you know it's like a word processor. They can highlight something, they can bold it, they can italicize, they can center. They can do all the things that maybe me as a developer might be horrified by, but you know what? That's their choice. They can format this in rich text. And that's a big change from having to type things and format like paragraphs and links and all of those little bits um, for code editors. And we want them to make content. That's, that's the purpose, to make great content. Um, some other cool blocks that we have is we have the content listing block. And I'll just open this one here. And content listing is already like a default mosaic block, but what we have on these is we have different views, so they can change the view depending on what type of content they're trying to list. So this is curated events view, but let's say I had a conference and I wanted an agenda view. I could change that and there we go. We've got a whole new look just that easily. So it can really go through and replicate a lot of their existing styles with just a drop down menu and they can even control what fields are listing in that view, which is great. So you can have news with a date, you can have news with just titles, you can just list bios, you have a lot of power. Um, of course, for the people who love HTML, we've still got this raw HTML tile where you can just put in your code directly. But this is great if you have like embeds from sites like a like mosaics or like Twitter embeds or anything, they have the ability to embed that on their site and we don't have to go through a code release or go through the back end. It's a safe place to put it. And then once again, just all the different types of rich tiles that they've got to use. And that's just a beginning of that. And what's even more interesting about that, I'm gonna cancel in case I did anything crazy, is with the display view, they have the full width mosaic view, which is great if you're doing a homepage, but let's say I'm in the page, but I need access to these tiles. They can just do the typical mosaic layout view. And this will just look like a normal page. Now, of course, I wouldn't do as much fanciness on a normal page, but that allows them to use news blocks or people listings all within the context of their page without having to do all these different display views. Remember, this does this and this does that other thing. So that's some of the fun thing we did for them in Mosaic. And I know there's so much more. And as we come across different requirements in the site, we add tiles or change layouts so that they can get more and more uh, features. So one of the things I touched on earlier was, you know, just the, the resistance to change that happens sometimes, really in any context or industry, but especially in higher education. So uh, we, one of the things we had to come up with was a way to kind of alleviate some of the anxiety around changing CMSs, especially going from a really old CMS like Zope into something new and exciting like Plone. So one of the solutions in working with Six Feet Up we came up with was a sandbox. And so it really, the name kind of implies what it does. It really, uh, it becomes kind of a safe space for our users to, to try things, demo uh, a certain, you know, trying out Mosaic, demo at, demo a, a, you know, one of the plugins, try things just for the first time without any fear of messing anything up. So, you know, it's one of the problems, one of the big problems we have in Zoop is just, you know, the development environment is, is the production environment. You know, you don't have any way to, to try something because you might, you might mess something up. And so you become fearful. And then when you're fearful, 
you don't you don't learn and that's a problem so the sandbox really kind of becomes that place where they can test things we can train them and they can stay in that sandbox as long as they want until they're comfortable enough to start working on production and and start really editing their site uh so that's that was that was one of the big things we we decided to add to this uh this migration effort if you go to the next slide um it becomes uh that's one of our big outcomes and so that's where you know kind of putting a bow on all of this um you know we kind of talked that we kind of hit on this idea of collaboration and discussion um i mentioned how just like in a lot of higher ed settings there's a lot of siloing that goes on there's a lot of you know departments that that work and don't talk to one another so having having someone like six feet up like Annette, like chrissy like gabrielle all of the all the folks that six feet up were able to to really be that glue that that brought us all together got us all at the table we started to understand more about what our it group ecn needs they started understood they started to understand what the communications group eco needs and then six feet up just made sure to translate back and forth okay we have a solution for this there's a way that that we can make everyone you know it fulfills everyone's needs now we're talking you know now we're actually discussing every single every feature every every single subsite that we roll out there's a discussion that happens and so that that's due in large part to you know six feet up's ability to uh to break down those barriers um to go to the next slide you know kind of looking at sort of the uh the 32,000 foot view of this entire project i want to kind of touch on some of the milestones we hit um so you know obviously moving from zope to plone we had that was a major milestone. We we're actually in a, a more modernized infrastructure. We're using the latest version of Python. Um, it, it resolves a lot of those security concerns that we were having around using the old version of Python. Um, we have a brand compliant front end. All of our templates, styles, everything is right on, right in lockstep with the university's brand guidelines. Uh, we have a sandbox, like a demo environment, to alleviate a lot of the anxiety and some of the training concerns we had for our new users um that's been huge for us and then obviously at the end of the day you know what you get what comes out of all this are content editors people who are like i said who are not designers and not developers no background you end up with a trained team of individuals who can build sites prototype sites rapidly it gets a lot of that a lot of that interference a lot of that stuff that would get in the way of them doing their jobs doing what they do best is now no longer a concern and so when you look at this next slide here and that um we now have content editors who feel truly empowered to, to work on their websites without any fear of messing anything up. It's a visual interface and they, they can they can work confidently in a more modernized and secure environment. And that's really what this has been all about. I mean, from the from day one, this entire migration has been about trying to bring people who are not web designers and developers into this environment in a way that they can they can perform actions maintain their sites with very little to no oversight from from my team and so now my team can focus on some of the new and exciting initiatives that we're working on and that's where talking about what's coming next next slide uh becomes the discussion so really this becomes this is really an ongoing project we have i mean we've done so much already but really this has been the tip of the iceberg um there are so many more things we can do utilizing some of the technology and abilities that plone affords us so we have, I mentioned it earlier, you know, when you have over 30,000 pages, a lot of those pages are, are maintained by faculty and their research groups and grad students. And so how do we start to really scale the solution so that they can, they can now become a part of it and they can start working in Mosaic and they can start rapidly prototyping sites of their own. Um, that's where we're gonna start, you know, we're gonna start looking at our web apps. Like how can we start building out new and exciting web apps using, using Python in Plone that solves a lot of those problems that we've been, relying on since the early 2000s. So uh, I, I truly couldn't be more pleased with, with how all this has gone. I cannot wait to see what comes with the future holds. Uh, obviously working with Annette has been a dream come true. And uh, not only that, not only her, but the Six Feet Up team. Uh, so I, for anyone who's about to start a migration, you're looking at the different options out there. Um, if you, I, I highly encourage anyone to look at Plone. Obviously this is the Plone conference, but um, it's been, it's been a, just incredible just to, to see what this thing's capable of and, and to see where it's going. Uh, and, and it's, it's backed by such a, a wonderful community of people who know, you know, what's, what's coming and, and, and where we're going to go. So, um, yeah, I, at this point, I guess we're, uh, we're open to any questions.
Yep. And like, once again, like I'm, I was very excited to get on this project. It's always fun collaborating with groups. I love it when we can collaborate and actually come up with solutions. And uh, I think few things make me happier, even than making something really cool than seeing a user who is empowered and owns their content and actually is excited to do that. So it's been exciting working with you guys. I, I'm excited to see what else. Like I know there's more surprises somewhere in your site, but coming up with the solutions and just trying to come up with things that work the best for the users who are really going to be using it, that is a dream goal for me. So yeah, uh, thank you for attending our talk. Once again, I'm Annette. You can find me Annette at Six Feet Up and my co-presenter, Will. Thank you so much. And Absolutely. then I guess we'll head over to the Jitsi. Take it away, Kim. Thank you so much, Will and Annette for giving this talk. It, um, just looking, listening to you from the perspective of somebody who's been using Plone for a long time and who cares deeply about the project and the community, it's, it's, like, a, it's like a heartfelt, love song so thank you <laughs> i know it's for a lamborghini but i mean i'll take <laughs> it um we do have a question for you from philip bauer is the sandbox open for all editors and is the content synced from production regularly and then a second part is the sandbox um on top of a test and staging environment yeah so the sandbox um we really we utilize it as sort of kind of that first step when we have a, uh, a unit that is interested in starting to move their site over to Plone. Um, we kind of use the sandbox as the way to bring them in. So, you know, anyone who, who we know is going to be working in Plone, we always kind of make that sandbox. We give them access to the sandbox first. We let them play around and do as you might do in a sandbox. And then we sort of transition that into a training, like a guided training. Um, and that's, you know, that's kind of how it all begins. We don't like not necessarily anybody has access to the sandbox at any given time. It's kind of like the, it's sort of like the holding place for people who are kind of the, you know, the, the plone Padawans, if you will, they're, they're kind of starting out their, their, their plone experience. And eventually they get moved over to the workshop environment once they're done in the sandbox. Um, and as far as like resetting the sandbox, this is one thing I, I forgot to mention. Uh, yeah, it, it's super simple for us to reset. So, you know, we can actually, um, you know, with like three really easy steps, we can, we can, wipe anything that anyone's done on the sandbox and revert it back to the way our workshop or our production environment looks. So if they want to get a really good simulation of what it's like to work, you know, in those environments, we can just, we can just wipe it clean and duplicate everything that's, that's on that production environment. They can manipulate it. They can try things out. Uh, so hopefully that answers their question. I let me know if there's anything else I can elaborate on with the sandbox. Thank you all. I believe uh, Philip will probably be joining. Well, everybody, please join Will and Annette in the Jitsi. Uh, I posted the link in the Slack in the conference two uh, track two, sorry, conference track two Slack channel. But uh, it's it's the blue button underneath the video frame that you're looking at us in in Loud Swarm. You know the drill. So uh, thank you again, Will and Annette. And let's head over to the Jitsi for more Q and A and feedback suggestions. Thank you. Thank you.